Hi, I'm Stephen Cobb, and in the talk you're about to see, I'm going to explain how and why cybercrime is undermining human health and our quality of life. This talk was first delivered at the Cyberhagen Conference in Denmark in September of 2024, and I'm very grateful to the organisers and sponsors of the event for allowing me to share their recording of my presentation. Cyberhagen is an excellent annual cybersecurity conference that's been around for more than a decade. It's organised by CSIS, a provider of cybersecurity services that has been around for more than two decades. The theme of Cyberhagen 2024 was Front Lines in Cybersecurity. And my talk is titled From Frontlines to Lifelines How Reducing Cybercrime Would Make Life Healthier for Us All. I hope you find the talk helpful. There's a link at the end to obtain a copy of the slides and access some more of my work on this topic. Uh, if you do find this work helpful, uh, then please share it with others. The more people that understand the negative impact of cybercrime on our lives, the greater the chances are that we will be able to do something about it. Thank you very much. So my topic is from front lines to lifelines. And I'm going to argue that reducing cybercrime would make life healthier for us all. So I'm going to argue that reducing cybercrime will make life healthier for us all. This does presuppose that we will at some point be able to reduce cybercrime. Uh, I'm not going to get into that argument, but this is an argument for doing more to reduce cybercrime. Why would it make it healthier for us? Because exposure to cybercrime is harmful to humans and hard to avoid. And I will provide some scientific basis for that. Uh, realizing this, if we can internalize the fact that it's harmful for us all, cybercrime, then that is an ability, it gives us the opportunity to elevate the cybersecurity narrative, which I think needs to change. We, we're focused so far too much on corporate losses and uh, the financial aspect of cybercrime, we need to look more at the human aspect. So doing better at cybersecurity and cybercrime deterrence will reduce healthcare costs and improve lives. Um, if we get to the end and you don't agree, I'd be happy to talk some more. As I said, it's not my first time speaking in Copenhagen. Um, somebody was kind enough back in 1997 to fly me over here from Florida, where I was living at the time, to speak at the Network 97 conference. Anybody there at the Network 97 conference um, uh, speak about firewalls? Uh, that was a busy time for IT security. Uh, and one of the speakers earlier today was talking about, I don't know if I should go into cybersecurity. Will it be a thing in five years' time? Um, it's still very exciting, very busy. That's 18 months, the talks I did around the world in that 96, 97 time period. So very busy multiple front lines, and these have evolved over time. So the first time I did work with a computer was to try and get a tax auditing program written by a data processing, state data processing department that ran on an IBM 3033 mainframe. Later on in life, as I got into cybersecurity and cybercrime, I got a criminologist perspective, and a criminologist would look at that and say, well, that's going to be really hard to steal. That it's not a trivial point because just a few years later, the in 1981, the IBM PC came out, and that's where companies started to put all their useful information. They were expensive. In today's dollars, $11,000 uh, for a, well, the specs are pretty primitive, but that was the thing to have, and companies were buying them uh, by the thousands. And from a criminologist's perspective, you can run away with that. You might need a mate to carry parts of it. But that was how I got into cybersecurity. I had a client who was a management consultant, a one-man operation, and he went in one morning and his computer was gone. And I'd been teaching computer, uh, how to use computer apps, how to use spreadsheets and word processing programs and so on. And, and it just never occurred to me that that would be a problem. So I started to think about it. And as a result, I wrote a book about it. Uh, came out in 1992. Then as I got into the business, and by the way, if you want to get into a business, writing a book about it's quite good. It's quite scary. If you publish a book about a subject, people assume you know what you're talking about. And my 
I have vowed to try and know what I'm talking about ever since I wrote that book. I got into firewalls, uh, which were a hot topic. Best product category name ever. People wanted to buy firewalls even before they knew what they were because they sounded really cool. Um, then e-commerce. So I did quite a bit of consulting on the risks of plunging into doing commerce on the web and the problems you might run into. And very apropos of our previous session, early on, uh, the demand for cybersecurity skills was clearly going to be a problem. Now, my wife, who is better at cybersecurity than I am, she wrote Network Security for Dummies. Um, back in the 90s, we were concerned that there would maybe never be enough people who could get cybersecurity, that they really understood it. And that has continued to be a, a theme. Uh, so we started some companies, my, some friends and I, we started a cybersecurity company to do penetration testing and security education. Uh, that did well. We sold that and we founded a, a privacy company uh, developing products to protect privacy and doing privacy. Privacy education for security people and security education for privacy people. Uh, most of this was in America. Um, by 2011, I was working for ESET, the uh, Slovakian antivirus company, and one of my jobs there was to go and talk to groups of people, not in the security industry, but um, civic groups, the general population, computer users. And I heard more and more about, um, oh, sorry, I skipped a point there. That, that point there, the uh, skills gap, that was my master's dissertation. And uh, I'd be happy, that's online, it's quite easy to find, I think. Um, about what it takes to be a good CISO. And it, it tracked very, very well with the previous presentation. But no, I was going out, talking to people about how to protect their computer and their data and their privacy and their information, getting more and more stories of the effects that this was having on people if they got caught up in a scam. Uh, and less focus, as I went on, on the corporate side of it, more on the personal side of it. I retired from ESET in 2019. Uh, at that point, I was working in San Diego. We moved back to England uh, to be near my mum, who turned 90 in that year. Uh, unfortunately, shortly after um, we made that move, my wife had a brain hemorrhage, and I became her carer. Um, in America, they call it caregiver. What, what do you say in Denmark? Do you say carer or caregiver? Carer? Is that? You're looking after somebody in your family or a friend and so on, yeah. So in that role, I met a lot of other people who were carers, uh, people who had disabilities, who were looking after people with disabilities, and realized that they were a particularly vulnerable group of people who were uh, an, a target for fraud and so on. And so basically, after the, the last 30 years, I've spent that time urging people to take cybersecurity and cybercrime a lot more seriously than they have so far. So this is how things look in a lot of front lines. Uh, we're in the network operations center. Somebody sees a problem. Uh, it gets escalated to the security operations center. It looks like it's a, it is a serious problem. There's a breach, and we're going to have to work on containing the breach. And that's what a lot of cybersecurity front lines are like. But this is also a front line. This is a lady who's checking her bank account online and found out that money's gone. And it went because somebody got information from that data breach and used it to get their way into her account. So this, you've got the breach problem and the protecting the information problem at an organizational level. And when that fails, it fuels, and we saw several examples of that earlier today, the victimization of people. And uh, today in the UK, it's the most common form of crime there is, fraud, most of it online. Uh, in America, people are, there was a survey asking people about attempted fraud, so email, phishing, phone calls. People there say it's so bad, it's a crisis level. Uh, you can see why. This is another survey. A large group of people surveyed. American adults, 45% every day 
get some sort of uh, suspicious, fraudulent, scam-type email. What about Denmark? Well, um, yes, there's a problem here. Uh, you probably aware of that. I won't go through all the numbers, but basically it's growing at an alarming rate, a 50% increase from one half year to the next, 150% increase, not good. The shape of cybercrime, and I, I won't belabor this too much, but it looks like this. Um, if you want to know more about the uh, cybercrime and measuring cybercrime metrics, I did a law journal article that's online. I know cybercrime metrics are difficult. There's a lot of argument about how accurate they are and so on. But I've tracked this set of numbers since 2001. They're FBI numbers which go by the dollar amount lost in confirmed cases. And that's the way the graph is going. And we don't see much sign of it going the other way anytime soon. That was a 10x growth in seven years. So internet crime, online crime, digital crime, e-crime, it's rising. As is awareness, though that it causes harm that goes beyond monetary losses. I would recommend to everybody who's working on the front line in an organization, uh, this report, Ransomware Victim Experience. It's a really detailed report on the psychological and emotional impact of an attack. And, and it could be ransomware, but it could be any other kind of major breach at an organization. But that's not really what I'm talking about. There's also the emotional impact on victims. So the, the late, great Ross Anderson was a pioneer in this area looking at the cost of cybercrime and in this paper with David Modick looked at the emotional cost and it's significant. It is as big, if not more, as the financial impact. And we know this from a very good study done by a consumer advocacy group in the UK called WITCH. And they used uh, an area of uh, social science called social value uh, and life quality, uh, life satisfaction uh, estimation. And it's a system that governments use to see what impact certain changes, uh, for example, a new factory in a, in a part of town, what effect it will have on people's sense of social value and well-being. And they found that in a group of people, large group of people, who had suffered on average about 600 pounds worth, or 600, uh, yeah, about 800 dollars worth of uh, loss from fraud, that the value you could put on their loss of well-being was 3,300 dollars, but it was 4,800 dollars if it was online. So harm to the individual is real, but it's even worse than that. That's only part of the harm. There is harm from crime, even if you're not directly uh, victimized. Just being exposed to crime uh, is mentally and physically harmful. Uh, not the same level of harm to everybody, but it's harmful. And there's plenty of evidence in the offline world. So uh, if you Google the term high crime neighborhood, you'll get loads of hits from studies in uh, criminology, epidemiology, environmental health, and something called exposomics, which looks into the effects of crime on people in the real world, the offline world. I have talked about this using the terms crime in cyberspace and crime in meat space, but I've decided that's not the best terminology. Meat space is a term from science fiction, really, but in real world terms, and we're talking um, real world effects. So this was a study of life expectancy, a studied connected with uh, crime levels. So in terms of the decile of crime, in crime rating for a neighborhood, if you were in a good neighborhood on this side, uh, your life expectancy was quite a bit higher than if you were in a, a high crime neighborhood. So it, and I posted this on, uh, on social media a while back, and people said, well, it's obvious, you know, you get killed if you're in a high crime neighborhood. You get, in, in America, it was shot. Um, no, this, this is a general reflection of how tough life is in a high crime neighborhood on your health. And this is down to very 
technical level, this is a study of C-reactive protein, which is an indicator of cardiovascular health. I'm not going to go through all of these. This slide deck is, is partly documentation, uh, and so you can look up the references. Uh, it's actually fattening, uh, in not in a good way. We should not get fat, but people put on weight living in a high-crime neighborhood. The stress uh, is a factor there. Um, Denmark has some interesting studies. Apparently, uh, some time ago, uh, Denmark took in a lot of refugees and assigned them randomly to different parts of the country. So people have been doing follow-up studies on how people fared in different kinds of neighborhoods. If you're in a disadvantaged neighborhood, which tends to be a high-crime neighborhood, your health has not been so good, probably. Um, it impacts mental health. Um, quite large relative to the effect of other covariants, uh, local area crime impacts mental health. Um, and there are numerous studies that show that. As I said, cardiometabolic risk. I uh, just check my time here. Okay. Um, yes, the, the effects are bad. There's a meta-analysis. Uh, Baranyi's study is, is very good. I like meta-analysis because somebody else does the work of looking into all the studies and correlating their findings, and they come out very strongly saying crime in residential areas is a significant public health, social, and economic legal concern. So what's a high-crime neighborhood look like uh, in meat space in the real world? Frequent visible criminal activity, signs of past crimes. Um, if you've done any criminology, you'll probably know the window, broken windows theory, uh, which suggests that uh, visible signs of disorder and crime can to lead basically to more of the same if they're not fixed. Um, that adds to the stress. Constant news of new crimes, constant reminders of crime risks. Uh, here I'll give you an online example. When I go to do online banking, the first thing that happens is I have to put in a code. right? My, and, the message from the bank is very helpfully telling me that only a fraudster would ask for it. And I know they're being kind and helpful, but on the other hand, it's reminding me that when I'm doing my online banking, I'm potentially a victim. And then when I log off, I get messages like, scammers are pretending to be the police, which, yes, kind of, yep, it's helpful for people to know that, but it doesn't feel, make me feel very good about doing online banking. And there is this sense in real world and in uh, online crime that the police aren't going to investigate, there's nothing they can do, and so people don't report it. I'm a big believer in reporting all crimes of every site to the police because then they can see patterns and it might help them figure things out. But there's a lack of trust in institutions you get, um, and you're often surrounded by ugly, inconvenient anti-crime measures. If you go into a neighborhood where all the windows have got bars on them, that doesn't feel good. Um, and this is actually what online has become. So we'll talk about these people in a moment, but if you look in any situation in life today, you can find people that are online and they are looking at their phones, looking at their devices, and they're getting constant uh, harassment and mental challenges about what's going on online. And it's not just the crime attempts, but it's the warnings. Every time they go online, they're seeing scary stuff about crime. <coughs> so I won't go through all of those, uh, but my favorite is enter digits two, four, or five of your secret number, which I really hate doing because I can never remember my secret number, so I write it down and then somebody might find that. But basically my argument is that online is a high crime neighborhood different from a physical neighborhood in that it's very hard to move out, all right? Um, it's not like you turn off and you're offline. If you have a smartphone, email address, or internet account, you are online. You have an on online presence, and it's there even when you're not online. Somebody could be hacking in, using stolen credentials to hack into my bank account now. I have an identity online that I have to worry about in addition to my physical identity. It, if you're online, savvy criminals can target you, your devices and your accounts, and it doesn't go away when you log off. And it's very difficult to move to a less crimey neighborhood. 
So if alpha line is unhealthy and hard to avoid, what are the implications? So the implications are many and varied, but I think basically it implies there's a greater incentive than we've had before to reduce cybercrime. Uh, governments, uh, and I, like I said, I've been trying to find ways to motivate organizations and people and governments to do more about cybercrime, make it a bigger priority. And the fact that if you made cybercrime, fighting cybercrime, reducing cybercrime a priority in your country, uh, that would actually help reduce healthcare costs in your country. And I'll give you an example of where that is starting to happen in a moment. Uh, the second, this point here, an impact on public policy. This, I think, is, is I'm, I'm working on a talk about this. I think there's a duty of care now. In England, uh, I, have, I do some volunteer driving for the hospital, and I talk to a lot of patients. More and more of them are telling me, I'm doing informal surveys while I drive them to the hospital, more and more are telling me they have to have an app or go on the web to do things like get a prescription uh, or book an appointment, get a blood test. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that's problematic for a number of reasons. There are some people who don't have internet connections. Internet connections cost money. But also, if somebody is going online for the first time because they have to, they're very much exposed uh, to online crime. So if a government is saying, we're going to save money running the government, or we're going to save money running the healthcare system by having people do things on apps, that comes with a duty of care. And I'm waiting for the right attorneys to show up to bring a case on that basis. Um, because I think, I think it could be a strong case. So I think also, if we realize the health impacts of crime, uh, it's a good way for cybersecurity research to do itself a favor. Uh, in the last few years I spent at ESET, we did a number of, we spent money on a number of surveys around people's attitude to cybercrime. And we were able to generate very interesting uh, headlines from that because it's, it, was, it turned out to be a much bigger problem than we realized even going into the survey. Uh, people very concerned about the growth of cybercrime, and that got picked up and reported uh, nationally. Uh, it was a very good uh, project. There can be new strategies for preventative medicine, medicine and population health management. Um, I think that there's a big opportunity for researchers in the area called exposomics. Has anybody talk, heard about exposomics or the exposome in healthcare? Uh, so in, in, the, in human health, we've got our genomics, our genome. So your current state of health depends on a number of things. Um, a lot of it depends on the genes that you have or don't have or the genes that are defective. My wife has hemochromatosis, which is a defective gene which causes problems. But the excitement about solving medical problems by studying the genome, the genomics, sort of started to run out of steam when people realized a lot is also determined by the environment that we're in. Uh, the air we breathe, does it have pollutants in it? Does it have nicotine and cigarette smoke in it? Um, the stresses that we're exposed to over the course of our life have a big effect. My father died of cancer 50 years ago from you working with asbestos when he was in the Navy in 1945-46. And people realize that it's not just through genes, it's the environment you're in. And so um, I borrowed this uh, picture. I, it's credited in the notes. This was the basic concept of the exposome. Um, it's all the things that affect us. And I think we need to expand that with something, maybe call it the online exposome, where you've got these things that we're immersed in. And immersed is an important word, I think, for the future. Uh, I haven't heard anybody talk about virtual reality at this conference, but more and more immersive experiences are coming digitally, and they have much greater power than just the screen and audio. So um, exposomics, interesting area to research the effect of, of crime on the 
uh, on a person's health through the environment. I think there's an opportunity to pursue original research in this area, uh, partnering with uh, charities, uh, foundations, and so on. Uh, it's good PR. It's good co uh, community social response, corporate social responsibility. And it can always lead to calls for action, again, to raise cybersecurity and fighting cybercrime as a priority in people's budgets. And research can lead to change. I've got a couple of examples. Uh, Age UK, which advocates for elderly people in the UK, uh, did quite a bit of research on the, in fact, the, effect, the effect of fraud on older people. And that was actually referenced in a new um, section of law in the United Kingdom. There is going into effect this year, by the end of the year, um, new regulations around fraud. And they made a ruling already that older people will get reimbursement for certain kinds of fraud. Uh, I mentioned uh, that research by which that helped influence the failure to prevent fraud uh, section of a new uh, act that will be uh, in force. And, and this is actually quite interesting from a business perspective. We talked about the other parts of the business. You need to know about this because if, you if you're doing business uh, in the UK, if your company is found not to have taken reasonable measures to prevent its, the organization being used for fraud, you could be found liable. And that was influenced, again, by research in this area. And this was a practical operation. Uh, Dudley is an area of the UK near where I live. The National Health Service funded a project to reduce uh, the impact of scams on the elderly, to protect the elderly. Uh, they, had, they installed a whole bunch of um, fraudulent phone call detectors and so on. Um, that proved very successful. Uh, they actually saved nine million pounds from falling into the hands of criminals in a, in a fairly short period of time. But it shows that it's possible to persuade health-oriented organizations to work on uh, fraud prevention and uh, prevent the harmful impacts of cybercrime. So the main points, I think, are that digital technology has added a new dimension uh, to our existence. You know, it's, it's, we've got this other part of ourselves now. And the negative health effects potentially will outweigh the benefits if we don't do better at cybersecurity and cyber deterrence. I am meeting more and more people who are fed up with being online, or are even who have not been online and are more and more determined not to go online, um, which isn't good, certainly if you're a tech company or if you're a company that's relying on digitalization to improve your business, this is headwind for digitalization. And I think that framing crime online as environmental exposure and an issue in population health management uh, could open doors to, as I say, uh, innovation and funding in cybersecurity, cybercrime reaction, uh, reduction, and victim support. So a number of the studies that I referenced talk about what could be done about crime's impact in, in communities. I think if we look at the victim side of things and the fallout from attempted victimization in that area, then we could find uh, ways of better supporting people. And I think I was going to put tack, but um, thank you for listening, and I think I've got time now for questions. <laughs>